from the European Parliament here in Brussels. This is Raw Politics. Thanks for joining us tonight. Here's what's coming up. Common grounds. Theresa May reaches out to opposition parties to try and break the Brexit deadlock. Why was that? From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thanks for joining us tonight. Here's what's coming up. Common ground. Theresa May reaches out to opposition to try and break the Brexit deadlock. Chilling effect as the chaos in Westminster continues. Sweden takes Swexit off the menu. Social skills, how populists are dominating social media ahead of the European elections. Toughening up, the EU Commission ramps up sanctions against members who flout the rule of law. And all smiles and a new chapter in one of Europe's longest standing rivalries starts with a selfie. Good evening. Welcome to Raw Politics. First up, it is time to meet tonight's panellists. First up, we've got Mary Honeyball. She is a British MEP with the Socialist and Democrats group here in the Parliament. Uh, Mary, Brexit continues to dominate. Uh, what did you make of what Mr Juncker had to say this afternoon? Well, I obviously listened to it very closely. And he seemed to be taking a hard line, saying that if an agreement wasn't reached by April the 12th, it would be a hard Brexit, a no-deal Brexit. Which um, st seems to still remain on the, on the table. Well, according but... to Mr Juncker, it does. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, as we have throughout this whole process, we've had very different views from here, from the European Commission and Council and, and from the government and in Westminster. And someone else who's got a very different view, uh, Jacqueline Foster, a British MEP uh, with the European Conservatives and Reformists. Which bit of Brexit are you looking out for? Well, I'm obviously looking at the way forward. Um, I always supported the withdrawal agreement. I, it's still on the table. I still think it's an option. I think it's something that we could get behind and avoid all of this. And I certainly do not want us to stand in a European election. Well, we're going to have to wait and see whether that's going to happen or not. And also, Tony Conley is the Europe editor with the Irish national broadcaster RTE and the author of Brexit and Ireland. Uh, I suppose you're looking at the wider pictures in some ways, Tony. Yeah, it's hard to stay away from what's happening in Westminster and seeing the fallout from Theresa May's offer last night, both for the Conservative Party and also the Labour Party. Some very tricky issues for both parties there. But of course, in here, here in Brussels and in European capitals, people are really trying to figure out how this will collide with the very careful choreography that was agreed at the European Council uh, last week. We cannot get away from it, can we? Uh, Brexit, it continues to dominate, and it is where we begin uh, tonight, what, almost three years after the referendum. Theresa May came up with a revolutionary idea last night, political compromise. After her deal was repeatedly rebuffed by her own party, she turned to the Labour leader and Jeremy Corbyn to help deliver Brexit. Her Conservative colleagues reacted bitterly with outrage and resignations. Despite this, the two leaders are still meeting and the spirit of compromise led to a rather odd atmosphere at Prime Minister's question time today. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister sits down later this afternoon with my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Brexit Secretary, she will hear no doubt that Labour's policy on Brexit is to secure membership of a customs union, the single market and, crucially, to get a people's vote on any yeah. deal. If she accepts that compromise, she can pass her deal and leave office. Will she do so? Prime Minister! 
I say to the honourable gentleman that the purpose of meeting with the leader of the opposition today is indeed to look at those areas that we can we agree on. I think there are actually a number of areas that we agree on in relation to Brexit. I think we both want to deliver uh, leaving the EU with a deal. I think we both want we both want to uh, protect jobs. I think we both want to ensure uh, that we end free movement. I think we both recognise the importance of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, what we want to do now is to find a way forward that can command the support of this House and deliver on Brexit, deliver on the result of the referendum, and ensure that people can continue to have trust in their politicians at doing what they ask us to do. Well, let's uh, cross now to London, and I'm joined by our uh, correspondent, uh, Vincent McAvinney, who is uh, standing by. G uh, good evening, uh, Vinny. Uh, we believe this meeting, I think, has finally started. Is there much optimism there in London that it can actually succeed? Good evening, Darren. Well, just as that meeting was kicking off, there was a giant clap of thunder and bolt of lightning over Westminster, so quite foreboding as they sit down. They have a number of their team with them, and we'll see over the coming hours whether or not Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May could agree. They had gone into that meeting with Jeremy Corbyn having said the Prime Minister needs to abandon her red lines, she needs to adopt the customs union, reform her immigration plans, and he himself, of course, has flip-flopped on the issue of a people's referendum. So some think that he might be willing to forego that if they can strike this deal. But what we know from the Prime Minister's previous meetings with other party leaders, when she got stuck a couple of weeks ago with her own withdrawal agreement, she met with the SNP and the Lib Dems and the independent group MPs. Uh, they just said that she sat in those meetings, she wouldn't listen, and just kept reiterating the same point. So we'll see when the news comes out from this meeting, whether there has been a shifting in the Prime Minister's position at heart, whether she does accept she needs to come to a more centrist position on this one. And there has been, though, a lot of disquiet from her backbenches. We heard earlier from Marc Francois and uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the hard Brexiteers in the ERG. Here's what they had to say. The problem is nobody's representing those who voted to leave. Both Jeremy Corbyn uh, and Theresa May backed Remain. And the views of the 52% who voted to leave the European Union are not being represented in this attempt at a coalition. So it's very worrying from the point of view of those of us who backed Brexit. I and a lot of Conservatives out there will be thinking, if Jeremy Corbyn's the answer, what on earth was the question that the Prime Minister was asking the Cabinet uh, yesterday? It just doesn't make sense. Now, I think what we're going to see over the next few days is more meetings between these leaders in a carefully choreographed dance because they're both going to want to look for their own respective parties like they have really negotiated hard with each other, that they have really come to a compromise that can work. And the theatrics of all of this are important as well because Theresa May didn't allow the meeting in here, number 10 Downing Street, with Jeremy Corbyn. It was actually held in Parliament. I think you can hear a bit more thunder and lightning there. So I think there's definitely going to be a, a bit of a rumbling as this meeting goes on. Vinny McAvinny uh, for us in London. Uh, stay warm and dry. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Mary, let's start with uh, you. What did you think when you heard Theresa May last night saying that, you know what, well, finally she's going to have serious talks with Jeremy Corbyn? Well, I'm a great believer in cross-party working. We do it all the time here. We're very used to working across most of the political spectrum here. So it's quite a natural thing for members of this parliament to do. So I thought it was seemingly quite a good idea. Um, whether, as your correspondent has said, they will actually be able to find something which works is a completely different matter because it's not the British tradition to do this. So there's a lot of obstacles to overcome. And the thing I was struck with as well was that Theresa May talked in the this clip from Parliament about wanting the support of Parliament. What she also needs, and Jeremy Corbyn also needs, is the support of the British people. So I hope whatever happens, it is put to a people's vote. In saying that, what was announced went down like a bit of cup of cold sick, I think it's fair to say, with some of your colleagues who think that this is treacherous almost. Well, I think it's very difficult because um, she has reached out to Jeremy Corbyn in the past and he's been very so on, a, he been, really, on a serious note he though? has been reticent to come forward the Labour Party have a position I fully respect that position but we raised a point there that you said they were going to talk about which was free movement he whipped in his MPs on an indicative vote very recently to actually um, to 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 stop the 
free movement, to continue with the free movement. And that runs completely counter to what his MPs stood but, for but how, how, at the last but how do you, how do you, election. But how do you feel that she's now effectively ruled out no deal? Well, the no deal issue is... And the no-deal issue is, is very polarised in any event. And I can understand why people think they can live with it. I have an issue with it because I don't believe that WTO is relevant for everything. It is complex. Uh, in terms of my view on all of this, what we actually want for those 17.4 million people who voted to leave, we have a withdrawal agreement on the table and it covers all of these issues. And what I would want to do is urge right across my own party and the unionists to actually come on side, because I actually truly believe that that is the way we can move forward. Uh, so, Tony, just on a wider perspective of this and looking, looking at it from Brussels, um, is this a trap? Is this just a very clever political strategy by uh, Theresa May, as some have suggested? Um, or is, is this a significant shift by the British Prime Minister? I think it's a very significant shift. Um, I think lab, um, elements of the Labour Party clearly think it's a trap because it forces Jeremy Corbyn to prove his Brexiteer credentials, if you like, when he's under tremendous pressure from his own party uh, to defend the idea of a confirmatory referendum or a people's vote. Uh, and I think already you can see a lot of unease in Labour ranks uh, about that being a precondition to any of these talks. Um, I think it has, it has been quite unsettling here in Brussels because there was a very clear choreography. Uh, she had to get the vote uh, through the House of Commons last week, and on that basis, on the 22nd of May, they would leave. If she didn't, then next Friday, as we know, was the deadline for either no deal or a longer, a longer extension. extension. And this kind of uh, unsettles that uh, delicate uh, arrangement. Um, how is Jeremy Corbyn going to play this? Because we keep reflecting the splits within the Conservative Party, but the Labour Party are split on this as well. There are many MPs um, who want Brexit. There are many who want a second referendum, some who want a softer Brexit. I mean, is Jeremy Corbyn going to play politics with this? I'm sure he will. Um, you're right. The Labour Party, I think, is as split as the Conservative Party. And we should all recognise that. And that's the thing that's made this very difficult. Added to which the referendum result, despite what you hear, was actually very close. So you've got a party, parties which are very divided and a country which is divided, which makes coming to some sort of agreement over this incredibly difficult. And I think Jeremy Corbyn is... It's got a tremendous task on his hands and he does represent a particular view and that's not not necessarily the view of all of his MPs and it's absolutely not the view of party members at uh, the last poll that was done on this it was something in the high but, 80s yeah. of member percentage of Labour Party members actually want to remain in the European uh, Union but, uh, but isn't this too little too late why why wasn't Theresa May doing this six months ago well, look, we, we can't keep turning the clock back. And whoever was actually Prime Minister was... This was a big poison chalice. And you had, obviously, you had both, both wings of the party plus opposition. That's not criticising anybody. And as being quite rightly pointed out, there are very diverse, divergent views. So it was always going to be a challenge. And this is why what we do understand sitting in this house is that we have... I have negotiated with 27 other countries for nearly 20 years. We know how we compromise. We know how we can get there. And that was my... My view was, and coming from a family that came from Northern Ireland, that the withdrawal agreement that was negotiated in November, which has been reinforced by the Attorney General, because there are concerns about border issues, in my view, that was the most sensible, pragmatic way forward and it delivered for the 17.4 million British citizens who voted to leave the European just, Union. Tony, just, just quickly on this point, um, how much frustration is there here in Brussels and other European capitals about the mess in Westminster? I mean, I think the frustration has been there quite a long time. Uh, people have started to factor that into a lot of the calculations. I mean, it's true um, that, you know, uh, leaders in Europe don't have that tradition of the kind of savage binary nature of UK politics. A lot of other countries are very comfortable and familiar with the idea of coalition politics. And I think that has fed into this incapacity to understand what's going on. Well, let's reflect that now, because part of Theresa May's pitch, of course, to break the Brexit deadlock uh, was to ask the EU for a short extension to Article 50. But there is no guarantee that EU leaders will sign up to that. Today, we heard from Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission here in the Parliament, where he warned uh, that if the UK has not approved an exit deal by April 12th, then further short extensions will not be possible. 
le 12 avril est cependant la date ultime d'approbation possible. Si la Chambre des communes ne s'est pas prononcée avant cette date, aucune prolongation supplémentaire de courte durée ne sera possible. Après le 12 avril... Après le 12 avril, nous risquons de mettre en danger le bon déroulement des élections au Parlement européen et de menacer le bon fonctionnement de l'Union européenne. Meanwhile, the EU is still stepping up its preparations for a no-deal Brexit. Uh, here's a reminder of what the custom controls that will come into place on goods arriving from the UK in the result of a no-deal. Uh, uh, we heard uh, from Pierre Moscovici. He's the EU's Economic Affairs and Tax Commissioner. Both the EU and the UK would face numerous challenges. They would need to protect their respective markets, public health, uh, consumer safety, legitimate businesses, uh, and carry out the necessary checks um, in the least disruptive manner possible uh, and as much as possible away from the border. I insist on that. Uh, what matters um, is how these checks take place and that we ensure the customs codes apply everywhere in the uh, EU. Now here with me uh, for more European reactions is the German EPP MEP, a member of the Brexit steering uh, group, uh, Elmer Brock, and Miriam Daly, a Maltese MEP with the Socialist and Democrats, and still with us, of course, uh, Tony Conley from RTE. Um, Elmer, let's start with you first of all. Um, is it your understanding that if there is no agreement in London, in Westminster, by next Friday, it is either a long extension or Britain crashes out. No short extension. Short extension does not make sense. Then this indicative vote sessions will continue in the House of Commons and nothing will change uh, the situation. Then we need a long prolongation where the people has to speak. It must be combined with new elections, a referendum and so on. So that the deadlock can be uh, finished by the people. Uh, do, do, will the European Union at the end of next week, if the UK asks for a long extension, will they stipulate that they will only grant that if there are certain conditions like a general election or a referendum attached? I think so, and that is my clear opinion that the vast majority in the European Parliament to do so. And also it means it, uh, that Britain has to do a gentleman's agreement, which means that they, in that time, because they are in the European elections, that they have to uh, take part in the European elections, uh, that they do not misuse the situation, that they do not interfere in very structural decisions of the European Union, for example, in the budget questions uh, and the questions of setting up the Commission and so on. I think it would be not fair if you want to go out but uh, decide about the main structures of our work in the next five years. Isn't the problem here, though, Miriam, that actually not everyone is agreed on a long extension. Lots of people do not want Brexit uncertainty to carry on for years and years and years to come. I get the feeling that we're going around in circles and we have been going <laughs> around in circles for a long time and that is why many people are questioning also what would happen if we have a long extension. Having said that, I can't fathom a situation where we go for another shot extension. I've heard the date of the 22nd of May being floated, but really and truly, if we're going for the 22nd of May, my personal stand would be that we would need to have a commitment that the withdrawal agreement is going to be ratified. If no such commitment is in place, um, we can't be in a situation where we'll give an extension until the 22nd of May, because there are the European Parliament elections, and that process will continue going on. So then we need to make Make sure that either it is a commitment that withdrawal agreement is ratified or no such short extension can be provided. Um, so if Theresa May is insisting on a short extension, Europe saying no, Tony, it has to be a long one, but potentially with conditions, mm. that, is that going to be palatable to Westminster? I, I think that's going to be tough for Westminster, but I think the options are so narrowed at this stage that uh, I think uh, they will have to swallow this idea. I mean, already David Liddington, the Deputy Prime Minister, has signalled to returning officers that they can start spending money 
to arrange these elections. So in a sense, at the end of next week, you're going to have the firing gun uh, to start those elections. The question then is, are political parties going to start spending money to contest those elections? Uh, there is obviously a chance that if they do get this over the line before May the 22nd, then at the last minute, they can call off the elections. It's all very complicated. Indeed, but, um, but the Irish seem to be on side for a long extension. I think we heard from Leo Varadkar today saying that he thought there would be goodwill towards one. Yes, I mean, I think with a caveat, though, I think the Irish uh, government feel that, again, there has to be a clear justification for uh, a long extension. They don't want this legal fragility to be seeping into the European order in this new mandate with a new parliament and a new commission. And again, uh, as, as we've heard this question about whether uh, British ministers and MEPs can start to influence European law to their advantage when they're outside the European Union. What, what I don't understand is that Theresa May has now essentially ruled out no deal. OK, she said that she thinks the UK needs to lead in an orderly fashion. And yet the, cons the commission repeatedly now say it's more likely. How, how does that work? Because you are not able to find a solution or the Brits are not able to find a solution on the deal. It's just a British decision. But and I, if, they, if they cannot deliver a deal, it's hard Brexit. But, and, uh, but in whose interest is a hard Brexit? Surely... In nobody no wants, one's but we have a deadline on the 29th of May, uh, of March. March. We have prolonged that. And there might be some tricks to find a few more days, which is at a way. But it's always the withdrawal agreement has to be decided. Always. And even if you have a long uh, extension, it will has always be in a certain stage the withdrawal agreement. The, the, you can never avoid in under, uh, any option you're there to vote for a withdrawal agreement. Um, how do you judge Mrs May's role in all of this? Should, I... You know, shouldn't she be doing what she announced last night six months ago, a year ago? Two years ago. I mean, this process has been ongoing. This is not something that happened overnight. It's a process that has been ongoing for the past two years. So it's not something that happened all of a sudden and decisions need to be taken now. So, for example, Ms. Mrs May is now saying that she will sit down with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and they will have discussions. Fine. But did it have to arrive until today? The deadline passed. It was on the 29th of March. We have another deadline. Are we going to postpone in piecemeal um, extensions? Because that's what I'm seeing. And that's why I'm saying we're going around in circles. This requires a long-term solution. We're speaking about legal instability, but you have also business instability. You have automotive companies saying that they can't continue going on like this and investing in the UK if they don't have peace of mind and a long-term strategy. This is something that is really worrying because I'm afraid that we'll arrive once again on the 10th or 12th of April and there will be another request for an extension. And how long are we going well, to extend? Well, we'll have to wait and see. With uh, We may not be going around in circles, Could or be. if we are, we're also, <laughs> with every day, seeing a new twist and turn in Brexit. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. And at that point, we're going to take a quick break here on Raw Politics, but coming up, how populists are dominating social media ahead of the EU elections. Plus, the former Italian Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi, has his sights set on Brussels and he wants to shake things up. Find out what he's got planned after this quick break. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, having already visited more than 15 <laughs> European countries on his listening tour, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Manfred Weber's campaign for Commission President had already started. Well, it turns out the big event is, in fact, tonight. When, where and more, that's all in tonight's Ballot Buzz. Well, some would say it's not possible to go forward while looking back, Manfred Weber isn't one of them. In fact, the EPP leader has chosen to launch his big election campaign from here, the heart and home of European history. Housing the continent's best and worst bits, it's here that the Commission President hopeful will set out his plan for Europe, complete with website and slogan, the power of we. While Manfred Weber goes for strong and steady, others in his party are looking to shake things up. The former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi is running for a seat in the European Parliament. He says he'll campaign for a united Europe, where the bloc can be a world military power. But an alliance with socialists isn't the way to go about it. He wants the EPP to ally with right-wing populists instead. 
And while Brexit is tearing one country apart, could it be uniting another? Sweden's left party is the latest to revoke its campaign for a Swexit, meaning all Swedish parties are now in favour of staying in the EU for the first time in almost 25 years, including the Sweden Democrats, who spent a lengthy election campaign bashing Brussels. Well, here uh, with me for this discussion are two of our political insiders for the EU election analysis, Elmar Brock. The German MEP is back with us from the European People's Party. We've also got Marion Harkin, an Irish MEP with the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. And also joining me is Jennifer Baker, uh, the journalist from BrusselsGeek.com. Welcome to you all. Let's start with this idea about Euroscepticism. We're talking about Sweden just there. Uh, Elmar, do you think that actually... Ironically, almost, because of Brexit, that Euroscepticism will play less a role in this election than it's done in the past elsewhere in Europe. For sure, we have a situation that Brexit is helpful for European integration. <laughs> Nothing is uh, uh, useless. Uh, it, at least it can be used as a bad example. And therefore, Brexit will help us in many countries to see more the need and the importance of the European Union. Therefore, we have an increase in support of the European Union by nearly 10% in every country. And uh, therefore, I think I am not afraid about a European future, but we have to see that not just because of Europe, but also of changes in national politics. Yeah. We see that people are looking for a great leader again, and such a thing, and uh, liberal democracy is at stake. It's not just a European question, it's also a national question, and here, I'm really afraid. I never thought that in my political life I have to fight again for the rule of law and the liberal democracy, what we have to do now. Uh, that's also a battle that's helping, uh, happening elsewhere. But there is an Irexit party yes. campaigning in Ireland, people who want to leave the EU there. What's your sense of where Euroscepticism is, uh, you know, elsewhere in, in Europe? Well, I, I think at a low point at the moment. But as you and I know, the pendulum swings and it's just swung in that direction now. And I think Brexit has contributed to it. I think especially among young people, which, of course, frightens the or, hell or, out or, of politicians. Or, or, or has it just been redirected into a different type of populism? around things like migration, and we are expecting to see populist parties do quite well. Yes, but populist parties generally want to leave the European Union. And what we see now is they're divorcing themselves, as it were, from that stance. But whether that will be temporary or permanent, I don't know. But I think among young people, there is a sort of a sense about Europe that wasn't there before. I'm not saying it's universal. It's not a great wave-sweeping Europe, <laughs> but... It's there. OK. Um, Jennifer, let's focus on uh, Manfred Weber for a bit, as, as we did in that uh, little report. Why is he launching this campaign in a museum uh, oh. to Europe? Well, I mean, you can understand why someone somewhere along the line thought it was a good idea. It's the house of history, you know, building on European togetherness and hence sense of history. But I do actually think it's pretty tone deaf. It's nearly as bad as the power of we, you know, which I, you've got to wonder. <laughs> These slogans get more ridiculous. They're poor, tortured phrases that they turn around backwards, like change we can. I mean, they mean nothing ultimately. And I think it all comes down to much more to be a, a good candidate than really just these awful awful slogans that don't really work. And he needs to appeal to all of Europe, not, not just German speakers. And so that's, yeah. Someone um, should have stepped in and said, no, Manfred. <laughs> Elmer, do you feel the, the power of we? I feel it. <laughs> I feel it that we in Europe have to stay together, and yeah. especially the young people, or the British young people, for example. 75% for European integration. Because the younger generation has understood that in the question of internal and external security and trade, uh, in globalization and digitalization, but is, is, it's we can be only together survive against but is, is, Trump is, is and Ma the Chinese. Is Manfred Weber the best man for that job? He has led the biggest group very successfully. I am spent 40 years in this house. I've never seen a better group leader to bring the, the people together. His clear convictions. That's uh, his, not going to get uh, the youth vote. That's not going to get young people excited. Uh, you have no, he has asked me you know, that question. He has asked me, is he a good leader? Uh, that is a different question. <laughs> you were still at the old, the old question. Uh, and uh, I think it's also here in this question that he wants to do uh, in the economy things which has to do with the new world. But Survive as Europeans in this globalised world. This is the young generation wants to be solved. Well, OK, well, then let me put Jennifer's question. Yeah. Is, there, is, is, is Manfred Weber the man to, to reach to young people? 
I think so. Okay. You know, opinion polls uh, the highest at the moment. Okay. And just, so he has not made everything wrong. Um, just, just finally, though, would you also welcome Silvio Berlusconi back to the parliament? Do you think he'd be a good addition to the EPP? Look, uh, old Silvio, I think he will not stay a very long time in this European parliament and he will not be seen very often here. I was once a colleague for him. Uh, I have seen him very seldom here, so he will not play a major role in this European Parliament. He needs a seat because of your immunity reasons, because he has no seat in the Italian Parliament. Therefore, he's a candidate. It's nothing seriously to do with European policy. And, and just in terms of um, what we're... I think we're now 50 days out from this uh, election. Have you seen any kind of very noticeable change since the campaign's kind of finally started? <laughs> Well, I suppose I can't say I've seen anything really in Ireland. And I'd say in many countries, the campaign is only beginning to start. I mean, Berlusconi is on the stage now and we'll see how Italians react to him. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the EPP would be well off without him. He's talking about a military power and he said the European Union needs to sit at the table where these decisions, where the destiny of the world is going to be decided. It would be if good. Berlusconi thinks yep. the destiny of the world is military power, it's about climate change, well, it's about inequality, all of those but things, also that, that's yesterday's We should be on a place like in Syria to negotiate peace and we well, do not know at well, see, well, He's moment. certainly a colourful character. Uh, guys, thank you very much uh, for the time been because we're going to stay on this theme now. Uh, while Manfred Weber has launched his campaign uh, in a museum, populists in Europe are dominating the social media landscape, according to news research that's been analysed the public debate online ahead of May's EU elections. Alex Morgan and our team are at the Cube in Lyon at your news headquarters and have more. Good evening, Alex. Hello to you, Darren. Yes, a small group, a very small group flooding social media ahead of the EU elections. Now, the implication of that claim, of course, is clear. It's the idea of hijacking the online debate to try and win or secure your vote. So where's all this come from? Well, it's researched by uh, the big data analytics firm Alto Analytics. They examined uh, data across a one-month period, which ended on the 20th of January. So you're still a bit ahead of the actual uh, European elections. But from that period, look at some of their main findings. Let's just bring up what we've broken down here in the cube. They looked at five countries in particular. That's Italy, Spain, Germany, France and Poland. And they found, look at this, 0.1% of social media users generated around 10% of the conversation on political issues and conversation about the EU elections. 0.1% around 10%. How such a tiny group was able to amplify their voices, you can see, is a question people are asking. These have been called hyper users. That means some of them posting hundreds of pieces of content a day, backed up then by bots, that's automated accounts which reshare this information. Why does this matter? Well, of course, if a small group is able to burst out of their echo chambers by pushing fringe issues into the mainstream, they change the debate. And that change of debate could make things uh, very difficult uh, indeed, of course, in the run-up to the elections for mainstream candidates to push back. It's worth saying this analysis saying most of these accounts favouring fringe parties and right-wing parties. We spoke to Ben Nemo. He's an expert in looking at disinformation. And crucially, we asked him how ordinary users, how you and I can spot content that maybe isn't authentic, maybe is misleading, how we can spot that in our feeds. This is what Ben had to say. The other thing to watch out for is, is really, really emotional content. If there's a story out there which makes you feel very angry or very scared, then the first thing to do is step back and say, well, why is somebody trying to make me angry or scared? And the answer is normally because when you're angry or scared, you're much easier to manipulate. So it's really just, just be careful of the, of the hyper emotive language, because that's generally where you see the disinformation actors are trying to work. So the idea here, a small group trying to manipulate the wider conversation and, by extension, you and I. Ben's advice there, be careful. Also saying, check multiple social media accounts, because if something's trending on one, it may not be trending on another platform. So if the hyper users are pushing something into the mainstream on one platform, Ben also advises you, check elsewhere. But do stay with us in the cube. Throughout the EU elections, we'll be fighting the disinformation and letting you know what you can trust all the way through, Darren. Alex, thank you very much indeed. Alex Morgan for us there at your news headquarters. Uh, Jennifer, this is going to be a big and continuing issue over, what, the next 50 days or so? 
Yeah, I mean, and it has been. I mean, the big push has been from the European Commission to use social media platforms to tackle this disinformation, and they've shied away from using any sort of hard regulation because, well, they were heavily lobbied by those same tech giants. But at the same time, you've got to worry about the fact that these, you know, three, four companies maybe are the gatekeepers to all our information in Europe, and they are not based in Europe, and they don't really necessarily get our electoral systems, how the European elections work. They don't know that by saying, oh, you can only fund an advert, a political advert from inside the country that you're based in, that they're shutting off, you know, the European Parliament groups yep. from advertising across Europe. I mean, and they think they're doing a good thing, but there's a big cultural mismatch between what the tech giants think is appropriate and what they can realistically do and what really matters to people who are just trying to find out how they vote. Yes. Well, it's certainly something we're going to be keeping an eye on. Uh, thank you to our election insiders, to Elmer, Marion and to Jennifer uh, for uh, joining us. And we'll, have, of course, have extensive coverage uh, ahead of the EU elections here on Euronews. But coming up here on Raw Politics tonight, selfie diplomacy. Greek and North Macedonian leaders bury the hatchet with an historic selfie. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, Brussels wants to crack down further on member states that flout its values. The Commission Vice President Franz Timmermans has called for a new debate on how to strengthen the rule of law in the EU while announcing a new measure to protect judges in Poland and a warning for Romania to get its justice system in line. Uh, the Union's capacity to uphold the rule of law is essential. First, because it's an issue of fundamental values, a matter of who we are. The functioning of the EU as a whole depends on the rule of law in all member states. Member states, economic operators and citizens need to be able to trust each other's legal systems because it is essential for the internal market, for investments, for judicial cooperation across the EU. A problem in one member state is a problem for the union as a whole. Under current rules, the bloc can react to rule of law violations by triggering Article 7, but critics say the so-called nuclear option has lacked progress since it was used against Hungary and Poland. Timmermans now says further action is needed. He put forward three new ideas, including, first, better promotion to improve knowledge of rule of law standards at a national level, second, early prevention, and third, a tailored response to ensure an effective answer to each rule of law challenge. Well, joining me now to discuss this, we've got Livia Yoroka, who is a Hungarian MEP with the Fidesz party, looking very colourful uh, tonight. Uh, we've also uh, got uh, Thomas uh, Waits, who is an Austrian MEP, who sits with the Greens and the EFA. And also we've got uh, Maria Udrescu, who is a journalist based here in Belgium. Uh, good evening to you all. First of all, let's start with what Franz Timmermans had to say today. He's got a point, hasn't he? Uh, I'm an anthropologist researching at the same time as just other research institutions. And what I found now when it comes to the rule of law, the Sargent in report also showed that the research that is done into rule of law in Eastern Europe or the knowledge, for example, is not enough. When they are attacking countries, they are not looking uh, at the fact that in other countries the same rule of law violations are going on. So there needs to be a mechanism, but not a double standard one and not for political but, reasons. But, but, they, but they would say there's not a double standard in the sense that we and Hungary is part of the European Union and there are set standards for every single country. Yes, but while Hungary is called, for example, for anti-Roma march, which is not even happening anymore, Sweden is never called for Nazi marches around Swedish uh, big countries, for example. Or now, for example, another member state is not called for desegregated education, while Hungary is hit heavily on it, which is not even true. I mean, uh, uh, so I believe that there needs to be good, good uh, knowledge of how the member states are dealing with the rule of law, but at the same time, I feel there must be a much better research into it. I mean, come on, the, the Roma parts of the Sargentini report is underestimating the, the, the EU, the EP. I mean, that's why I just wanted so, to Tom propose not to put those lies into the report. You is cannot. It, Thomas, is it lies or are Hungary being uh, on unduly, Roma, on unduly on the, done? Roma part. 
No, for sure not. Uh, parts of my family come from Hungary. I still have connections to Hungary. I mean, reducing the media freedom or even uh, uh, actually... No, I said on the um, Roma issue. Well, probably on the Roma issue, but... But you, you, ex you accept there are problems, though. Yeah, I mean, Which one? There, you mean well, with media the media? Freedom, on media freedom, mm, there's serious problems not. there. There's no, no media freedom on. in Hungary anymore. What do you you mean? have blacklists of journalists, you have That's Austrian, true. German, you have even Liberation uh, journalists, which are on the blacklist as being uncomfortable. Uh, there's hardly any independent what do you mean news they are anymore. Not, not the government they controls, the government interview. takes under control uh, the, whole, the whole public uh, television sector. Uh, it, you are under heavy pressure if you are not complying with what the government wants you to to do, uh, also the influence on the juridical system. Uh, you know, the difference between Hungary and other states, where we have problems all across the Union, it's not just exclusively in the formerly East European countries, we have problems also in with Roma Western politics, European. with Come Roma on. politics everywhere. It's a, it's a problem across the European Union. But but the Hungary is breaching European law constantly, the last 10 years, constantly, again and again and again. And that's why Hungary is a special problem within the and European Union. And then which are the points but, on but, which? But I'm just going to bring, just gonna bring Marie in here briefly. Um, isn't this, though, ultimately a sign uh, that this is a mess and, B, that Section 7 yeah. isn't working? Article 7, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, uh, Hungary has been a pioneer in uh, not respecting the European values. And Hungary, while has been teaching other EU member states how to go around these European values. I mean, Poland has been following this example, Romania as well. And the problem with the European Union is that it has tools to protect the rule of law, but the tools it has are based on the goodwill of the European member states. It goes, you know, it, it is based on the idea that uh, the European Union is a club of liberal democracies, and Romania, Poland and Hungary were very well aware of that when they decided to join the European Union. Now, so, not so, so much. Is, is Timberman's plan going to work? Well, what plan? We don't have a lot of details. <laughs> yes. We don't have a and lot of details on what, on what they want. I mean, be. this was about just starting a debate that has yes. that should have been started way back. I mean, in Romania, it has been. It's been two years since they've been trying to reform the judicial system. In Hungary, we're we're, we're talking like. Since 2010, so it's been uh, nine years yep. now. I mean, it's been a long nice time since there are problems. problems. So what, but, yeah, but what, 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 what I can understand is that everyone, everyone pretty much says that Hungary is doing this, uh, apart from you guys. <laughs> so is everyone else wrong and you're I right? I don't think so. I think there are so many people in Europe now, finally, who dare to stand up for these uh, values and for the double standard. What, mean, what values are they? Authoritarianism? What strong do you mean? Leadership? Not at all. A very strong family valued. Uh, 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 leadership is going on there. You should ask the people. I mean, three times they vote for them. I don't think that they, they mind having this government. And even if the liberal media, you were saying that all the media in Hungary, I mean, all, all those media are being uh, sort of centralized now that were centralized in other places. I mean, if you blame the government to buy the newspapers up, you should see who they are buying it from. And you should also see that the government can only buy newspapers you're, you're who are just, being sold you're just by the socialists. You're just recreating come, that picture of yes, some but kind how of come international years conspiracies. Ago you didn't say anything. This is completely ridiculous. No, how come 14 years ago but you didn't say anything thing against, I have to a man, yeah. a, uh, against the socialist uh, media? Let, let, so no, no, how I, come you didn't say anything? It's not a question on which government is there. We're also opposing no, you didn't a say social anything. democratic uh, government. You didn't. I remember oh, yes, I was here. No, We're in strongly, Hungary yeah. against the Romani Hungarian government, you never it's stood up. It's about European values. Darling. It's not about this or that government. I, every single country signed up to yes, the so to how a come you didn't say anything values. with the socialist government? But they well, are saying just something to, on Romania. To, the the yeah. Timmermans actually exactly. talked a lot about Do you remember, Slovakia, do you remember Czechia, the, the Mayor Garda yeah. case? You and didn't say a word. No, but how can you now say that Orban is a socialist? I suspect we're not going to settle this debate here and now. It is one that is going to continue, but thank you very much indeed for joining so. us. Thank you. Uh, right, well, I think we need a break after that, don't we, uh, here on Raw Politics? But join us after that break, because backed into a corner, Theresa May reaches out to Jeremy Corbyn. But is it too little, too late? We want to know what you think. Your call is coming up at 7pm CET. The information on uh, how to get in touch is on your screen. Call us on 00800 333702. It is free. You've got no reason not to, or get involved in the debate using the hashtag Raw Politics. Our lines are opening soon, and join us here in a couple of minutes.
Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, once again, we want to hear from you. But before we get stuck in, let's find out what we're talking about on tonight's Your Call. I'm offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition and to try to agree a plan. After three historic defeats to a Brexit deal, Theresa May finally blinks, offering to sit down with the Opposition Leader, Jeremy Corbyn. But with just nine days until Brexit, is May's compromise too little, too late? Meanwhile, is the chaos in Westminster having a chilling effect on Eurosceptics? Sweden's left party drops its long-standing pledge to have Sweden leave the European Union. For the first time since it joined in 1995, all Swedish parties are now in favour of staying in. So has Brexit killed off EU scepticism? They bring shame not only to football, but on the human race. And racism in football. The president of UEFA calls on referees to get tough. After three England players faced racist abuse at a Euro 2020 qualifier in Montenegro. And a Juventus striker was racially abused last night at a match. Should political leaders now step up? We want to know, does football racism need a political solution? Have your say, Europe. Is May's compromise too little, too late? Has Brexit killed off EU scepticism? And does football racism need a political solution? Well, all the contact information is now on your In screen. Country, uh, you can uh, give us a call on 00800 333 Send us an email, rawpoll at euronews.com. On social media, use the hashtag rawpolitics. And, of course, you can also Skype us in. Uh, just find the handle of raw politics. It's here to discuss this, uh, we've got a great selection of people. We've got Maria, uh, Thomas and Marion uh, joining us. And Thomas and Marion, you're on the, the programme uh, yes. tonight. Uh, first of all, let's start off with uh, Brexit, because as I say, it is the issue we cannot get away from. Um, is it too little, too late, what Theresa May did last night? Well, I don't think it's too late, even though there are differing voices on that. But I mean, the split in the Conservatives started this, and it got to a point where Theresa May knew her own party, the Conservatives, could never deliver Brexit. With all the talk, they could not deliver a Brexit of any kind. So the only choice she had was to go to the Labour Party. Whether that's wise, whether it'll bear fruit, we have to wait and see. But it's her only road at the moment. What do you think? Or is this a political game by Theresa May, just to buy more time to kind of kick the can down the road? Well, she's been doing that for quite some time now, and it's been too little too late for quite some time as well. I think the European Union has been eager to put the Brexit thing aside before the European elections, not only because the UK should organise elections as well, but also uh, because, OK, it can kill your scepticism, as we've seen. It can uh, be used as a counterexample to say, OK, look at, as this, uh, at this mess when you try to get out of the European Union, but it can also be used by your skeptics to say, oh, look, these people voted to get out of the European Union and they're still not out because the European Union won't let them. Yeah. them so. What do you think about that, Thomas? Well, I think the House finally comes to the point of democracy that they realize this is a highly divis divisive uh, uh, topic and they mm -hmm. got to talk to each other, you know? It's like half of the country was in favor of Brexit, the other half of the country was against of, uh, uh, the Brexit. So this is democracy, talk to each other, find compromises, build bridges, and this is something the House has got to learn because up to now the House was basically there uh, to, uh, well, uh, uh, get against each other, shout on shut, each other. Shut, yeah. Order, order, and here. <laughs> Here and yeah. exactly, exactly. all that sort of yeah. stuff. So they shall start to work together now. Yeah, this <laughs> well, is the election. Well, it's an interesting discussion, and we want to know, particularly at home, potentially, whether you were a Eurosceptic, not from Britain, and Brexit's potentially changed your mind. Uh, anyway, now it's time for tonight's raw moment, and it comes sealed with a selfie as the Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras concludes his first official visit to the newly named North Macedonia, cozying up to its leader. The pair documented the quick trip with a quick pick.
A lot of love in there, wasn't there? Uh, you, are you a selfie, a selfie person? I'm not, but I like the look of that. And I can <laughs> tell you, earlier we spoke about Weber starting his campaign in the House of History in a museum. Cypress knows the value of the selfie his... and the media attention it generates. Some history in the making there. Yes. But at least we end on some good news. We can often say that. We're going to see you two in just a couple of minutes on your call. Uh, Mary, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Of course, we want your views on all today's uh, big issues. You know what to do. Pick up the phone, get in touch. Raw Politics returns tomorrow, but Raw Politics, your call is on in a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. But for now, thanks for watching.